This is a Wisconsin Ice series called On Tap, in which we do informal interviews with legislative leaders. Today we're interviewing the co-chairs of the Wisconsin Future Caucus. I want to thank, to my right, Representative Amanda Stuck of Appleton, a Democrat who represents the 57th District, and the Republican co-chair, Representative Adam Nealon of Pewaukee, who represents the 98th. Um, Wisconsin Future Caucus, what is it? Why does it exist? So the Future Caucus is a caucus of millennial legislators. It's part of a larger movement that started in 18 other states before we started one here in Wisconsin as part of the Millennial Action Project. And it really aims to bring millennials together across the aisle to work better across the aisle and to really do a better job of getting rid of that really strong partisanship that's taken hold of our capitals. Um, something that we're just really excited about, seeing if we can really bring some ideas forward in a more bipartisan way. Yeah. You know, it's something that currently doesn't exist, right? A, an opportunity for bipartisan conversations to take place on legislation, on different outre outreach projects, an opportunity to bring more people into the political arena. You know, politics, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't isn't just one uh, gender, isn't just one age, it crosses demographics. And this is an opportunity to bring more people into the process and discuss issues uh, in a bipartisan fashion like I said, it doesn't exist now. So just having that opportunity to discuss things, we might not always agree on things, but it provides an opportunity for us to discuss and ultimately have the best legislation at the end of the day. And the criteria is uh, elected officials, a legislator under roughly age 40. Amanda, is that right? Yeah, well, again, I always say we don't check IDs at the door, so we really welcome anybody who wants to work in a bipartisan fashion. Um, but really, sort of the goal is getting those millennial legislators together is they're really the future. They're the ones who tend to have a worldview of really more working together um, that we see. So we think that that's where our best bet is at working together. But again, anybody's welcome. We've even uh, welcomed staff members to come in and join us, really anybody who wants to come in and work together. Yeah, we actually had an event earlier this year, uh, and we had 40 people show up, uh, 10 legislators, uh, eight of them were millennials, two of them Generation Xers, but that's all right. Uh, it is the future caucus, not necessarily a millennial caucus. So people that are concerned about the future, about issues that impact young families, about issues that really are uh, today. Um, and we had 30 different people that weren't legislators that showed up. People from around Madison, entrepreneurs, people that worked in the building. Uh, we had somebody come from the health insurance industry. So it, it attracts people that are attracted to this type of opportunity to discuss politics, to discuss the world, uh, and, and discuss issues that are going to impact our future. How many times has it met? Uh, three times now? Three, three, times. Or times. Yeah, three or four times. Has there been, has members of the caucus coalesced around any one bill or one change that you'd like to see passed? So uh, we have coalesced around certain issues and areas. One thing is providing uh, more opportunities for uh, scholarship programs, educational like EdVest. Um, also, I, I'm big on technology and science, so I've been pushing uh, self-driving cars, uh, drones as issues, and I think people are really interested in, in those science and technology issues as well. Um, we haven't specifically came to consensus on specific legislation, uh, but we have discussed uh, you know, a wide range of topics, and also we think one of the best benefits is just providing a platform to discuss issues and also to reach out and bring new people in. How can the caucus, you alluded to this earlier, how can the caucus lay the groundwork for a, a political environment that is less toxic, nasty, and partisan. So. <laughs> well, I think, you know, Anna sort of said it, there really isn't anything like this right now. There's not a lot of natural opportunity to work with your colleagues across the aisle or really sit down and talk with them unless you really are intentional and make it happen. There's not a lot of natural ways to do that. So I think even just being intentional, creating something, creating a space for that is really the beginning um, because it helps you build trust, that trust that isn't really there right now all the time between parties. So once you start building that trust in those relationships, that makes it easier. It changes the tone a little bit. When you're focusing on areas you agree instead of just always focusing on the areas you disagree on, again, I think it just helps change that attitude a little bit. I agree 100%. I mean, how many opportunities do you have in your life to have a civil conversation about something with somebody you might disagree with them on? You know, so often we, we divide in caucus, you know, we have the Republicans in one room, the Democrats in another room, and when we finally get to the floor, we're at a point where we're debating, or we're arguing. 
You know, so there seems to be a lack of opportunity for people to come together in civil fashion, in a bipartisan manner, and discuss issues that we might not necessarily agree on, but we can find common ground. We can find issues that we do agree on. We can uh, build that trust, and, and then when there are issues that come up that are controversial or things that might divide, we have this platform that we can talk it out and try to understand uh, what are the things that are really dividing us and where are the things that we can get together around and try to make a positive difference? I respect you millennials and you're about to a number outnumber us we baby boomers But how do how do you as millennials? How does your approach to politics and life differ from Gen Xers and baby boomers your, your thoughts? Well, I'll say quickly, uh, when I first heard about this, I was a little skeptical, right? It sort of seems like, yeah, right, <laughs> like if you've been in the Capitol, there's no way this can work, right? So I went out to Boston, though. Um, they had a retreat for those of us that they wanted to bring on board to be part of this. And we heard from the states that had gone before us what they were doing, and they really were. They were making some progress. They really had some policy things come out of it. It seemed to be really working, and I was really inspired when I left there, and it really made me excited about what we can do here. But you know, I think part of it is some of the issues are just different. The issues millennials are concerned about, um, some of the social issues aren't as divisive with millennials as they are with some of the older legislators. Um, and I think there's sort of a more global world view, no matter what party you are, if you're a millennial. So I think that there's, um, again, less social issue, issues that divide us. Uh, more things that we agree on, or a different way we look at doing things. So I think there's a lot of things that even if you're on different sides of the aisle, we have more in common. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, to answer that in one word, it's just experience. Our experiences are different. You know, I mean, the world is changing at an incredibly rapid pace. You know, I think we could all agree on that. So what it's like to be looking for a home right now, what it's like to be looking to pay for your kids' education, what it's like to be raising kids, you know, to be trying to find a career out of college. The world's different, you know, and, and we have a little bit different experience in terms of entering the workplace, starting a family in, in today's day and age, you know, and, and how fast the world changes. I think our experience is, re is what really drives the conversation as to what makes us different. Adam, you've been in the assembly five years. Amanda, you've been in four. You've seen a trend. There's a trend in the Capitol of legislators serving in the assembly two, three, four years and then leaving, four terms and then leaving. Do, do you plan to stay in politics now that you've been in it long enough to have an opinion? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of hard to say right now. Um, I mean, certainly I think it's good to have people that are there for a long time that can bring experience and institutional knowledge. Um, of course, turnover can be good too, and when you have fresh eyes and fresh perspective. Um, I'm certainly not a uh, fan of term limits just for that reason, though, that I do think it's good to have people who have been there for a while. And, you know, I always say, as much as I'm proud of the Future Caucus, I certainly respect and know we need our legislators that have been there longer and who are from an older generation because their experience and their input is definitely uh, beneficial and something we need also. So I do think it's important to have a mixture of legislators of experience and uh, length of service. So I, I can't say for sure what my plan is now, but I do think it's good to so you've have those legislators that have been around longer. You've enjoyed your first two terms, yes. even though you've been in the minority, and we don't need to go there, that's yeah. part of it. Um, Adam, how did... How, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it, you know, in terms of being able to make a positive difference, you know, being able to create the first ever state robotics grant program to get more kids involved and provide opportunities in education uh, to, to be at the forefront of, of, of huge, you know, generational things like Foxconn. You know, I think that that's been rewarding. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I do a lot of outreach with young kids and I meet kids all the time that I'm like, this guy should be doing my job in five years. You know, so I think that there is a shelf life to these things. And I think, you know, we need to look at a way to bring more young people mm -hmm. into the political arena, you know, because they have so much more to offer in terms of, you know, their experience, you know, and when you have uh, things like science and technology and robotics and automation shaping our world so much. I think it's good to have kids that have a background in computer programming and, and know what computer science is. You know, so I think it's you know as times change, we need to have leaders that, that emerge from those generations to take up the mantle. Uh, and as long as I feel like I'm making a positive difference, I want to continue to stay uh, to stay at it. But I also see a lot of kids come through the pipeline that have a lot to offer too. So I think there is a shelf life to these things. Yeah, which, a follow-up question, when you see a bright young person 
who should enter politics, what's your elevator speech for why she or he should get into it, Amanda? Well, so what we know is that millennials especially really don't have a positive view of politics. They don't want to get involved. They don't see public service as a real career choice anymore. And so that's one of the things we have talked about is even just that being one of our goals is to really show people that there can be a different way to do politics and you really should be involved. But as far as an elevator speech, it really is about if you don't like what you see, though, you have to be part of the solution or nothing will change. Yeah, I agree. I think I would say that everyone has something to offer. You know, and there's a, an, an old Steve Jobs quote that the world's created by people that don't know any better than you do. You know, and you see things a certain way and you're like, well, why isn't anybody doing something about it? Well, you can. You can step up to the plate, you can rise to the occasion, and you can make a change uh, that, that will lead to a positive difference. And I think that it's important that, that we facilitate a, a generation of people that want to make the world a better place. You know, I think far too often in politics, people enter to burn it all down. You know, that they, they just, the system's broken, let's tear it all down. And I think that is a problem. I think we need to have leaders that want to leave the world a better place than where they found it. And I think that can start by bringing young people in that see the world in a way that they want to make a positive difference and, and still have that hope and that the ability that they're able to make a positive change. I want to ask a generational question. What did the baby boomers get right? What did we baby boomers get wrong? Just your first thought. <laughs> No, first on that one. <laughs> Adam, sure. baby boomers got right. Well, I would say, first and foremost, they provided a fantastic education and fantastic world for, for us to, to grow up in. I mean, the, the, the opportunities that we've had uh, growing up from the offspring of baby boomers is tremendous, phenomenal. I mean, uh, from you know, changes you've seen in education in, in schools, uh, you know, now you have personalized education. You know, you have all these changes that we've had in education through the years that, you know, the kids going through that, they are not responsible for those changes. They're the beneficiary of those changes. So I think uh, providing for children, providing extracurricular activities, providing things like robotics, uh, really focus on the next generation, I, I think has been tremendous. You know, and I think we have each generation makes strides. And, and you see the leaders of the corporate world right now, you know, they're baby boomers. And, and there has been a, a, a solid economy over the last decade, you know, and I think that there are a lot of things that they should be proud of. And first and foremost, it's probably providing uh, for their children at such a level that, that has led uh, to, to us getting more opportunities uh, and more uh, benefits than the previous generation. Anything come to mind, baby boomers got got a, a little wrong, Adam? <laughs> Well, I would say, uh, I, I don't want to be nitpicky, but I would say that, you know, the social media interactions are often slightly negative, right? I think people, they do, I love your answer. They do want to argue uh, on social media a lot when, you know, at a certain level, you, you can't convince somebody to change their worldview. Right? And I think we need to all be more cognizant of the fact that each one of us has a different experience in the world. Our views of the world has been shaped by our own experience. And people aren't dumb, people aren't wrong, people aren't evil for having a different political worldview uh, than you. They just have a different experience. So I think being able to, to maybe have a little more civil discourse online would be a positive. And your answer has nothing to do with the fact that the president this morning fired the Secretary of State on in a tweet, correct? <laughs> No, I don't think he's a baby boomer. So. Right. <laughs> Amanda, baby boomers got it right, got it wrong? Oh, um, okay. Well, let's start with, with wrong, maybe. Um, which I would say is some of the social issues. I mean, you mentioned specifically sort of online. Um, you know, I, I do think for too long we've institutionalized discrimination in some of the social things that I, yeah, I think we're starting to really understand the full impact of now and really take some notice of. And that's where I'm excited about uh, some of the millennial bipartisanship to really acknowledge some of those issues and, and do better where we haven't done so well in the past. Um, well, I will say, especially in Wisconsin focused, legislators that came before us have really done, um, I think, a really great job of setting up our system. And we have so many great resources here that we really, um, you know, I think, take for granted here, like our nonpartisan legislative reference bureaus and those agencies that we have here. So having kept those and really made those such a center of how we work here in politics, I think is something that, that is really good, something that was really done right, and that I hope we continue uh, to move forward with. Okay. 
Let's go to a popcorn round. When I say something, I'm going to give you a chance just to instantly respond. Ready? Um, student loan debt. Go. Uh, we need to fix it. <laughs> we need to fix it. Yes. Okay. Adam. This might be controversial. Not as big a deal as people think. You want to expand just for 20 seconds? Sure. Uh, you know, I think that one thing that we should be proud of is that everybody in, in the United States has an opportunity uh, to, to apply for student loans and have a lot of opportunities within Pell Grants, within different things, uh, to seek higher education. And I think that it's very important that we do seek higher education, but I think the real problem is, is that we're jumping into seeking higher education before we develop skills. So I think what it, our focus needs to be on how do we get kids to develop skills, to get real world experience, and to have a career they can fall back on, and then look at things like college, uh, if they want to go into management, like starting construction, go to college, go into construction management. So I think we just need to reframe the picture, and I think that student loan debt is something like buying a house, right? It's something like buying a car. It's a big commitment. Uh, it, it's a good investment. People are able to overcome obstacles and, and get into college, and that's great. Um, but I don't think that we are drowning in debt the way some people make it sound. Uh, but I think we need to reframe the discussion and maybe think that let's start by developing skills. Let's start by trying to place more kids into the workforce and not have as many kids jump into college when they're 18 and they don't know what the heck they're doing. So there's a lot of issues that go into that. Um, but I'm not sure this is a huge, enormous problem. If you don't want to answer this question, fine. Sure. Do you both have student loans? I do, yes. I pay off my student loan debt. Paid off student loans. Okay, do you want to PS on student loans for just a second? Sure. I mean, I agree with Adam in a lot of ways. I do think we need to do a better job of really helping kids understand what their options are, uh, what those options will mean to them. But I also do think sometimes it's a false choice. Myself, I was a single mother when I was putting myself through college. Um, so I didn't really have a choice. I had to take out loans. So I could get the disclosures about how much I'd be paying back all day long, but what was my choice really? To stay a poor single mother or to try and do something to better myself? Now because I tried to better myself, I'm stuck with a lot of debt that makes it hard to buy a home, to get a car. You know, it has an impact on your credit rating, which impacts all sorts of things. So um, I don't think it's always a choice whether to take those student loans or not. And they do end up with a huge impact for people. So we need to find a better way to make those more affordable, to really address uh, interest rates, make it easier for people to refinance and do things like that. The next subject, school safety. Who's turn, Amanda? Your thoughts on making schools safer? Yeah, especially as a mom, this really hits home for me. I worry every single day when I drop my kids off at school, is today going to be the day the shooting's at their school? Every time my son wants to go see a movie with his friends, is today the day it'll be our theater? Mm, uh, so uh, it's time. We really have no excuses anymore. We have to take action. We have to get serious about uh, gun safety and really having regulations around guns that keep people safe, that we know work, and that are oftentimes supported by the majority of people. Yeah, and I imagine this is going to be something that's certainly discussed in the future caucus, uh, you know. And uh, I would say that we have made tremendous strides in the past decade. I remember, you know, going to school, someone could just show up and sign a paper and come into the school. Now you have, you know, when I go to visit schools, they have, you enter in a locked room, you know. So uh, it's more difficult for strangers to get in, but the, the challenge is when a student that wants to do harm, when we're allowing students into that school, you know, there's not going to be as much restrictions. So there are certainly more things we can do, you know, and I think that we all, I think this is uh, exactly the place for it to have these bipartisan conversations, you know, because these issues aren't left or right, they impact all children, you know, keeping children safe should be our top priority. So I think that having uh, uh, these conversations moving forward, I think is going to be important. It'll be interesting to see what ideas come uh, if we do in the special session. You know, there was some discussion about uh, providing more money for, you know, armed guards in schools, um, but I think there will be more conversations in terms of uh, improving the infrastructure as well and not just you know arming people on, on school grounds but actually having improved infrastructure to keep people safe uh, but I would say uh, my popcorn response is more needs to be done. Should that discussion include changes to gun laws? Adam? I think you, you, you have to look at the whole picture right and I, I think that you know there is uh, there are things that we should look at 
You know, I know there's been conversations in our caucus uh, about devices to make uh, semi-automatic weapons, automatic weapons. You know, that's something that we've discussed in our caucus. You know, there's been discussions uh, about uh, having, making sure that everybody that purchases a gun um, has uh, a background check. You know, these are conversations I think we need to, we need to have. You know, what comes of that? Uh, th there's, you know, more than just me and Amanda that are going to go into this conversation. So, you know, you could have an opinion, um, but ultimately, as a legislator, often you get a yes or no vote. Uh, so uh, these conversations are going to take place, and, and I think they should. Uh, but what's going to come of it, uh, you know, it's hard to predict. Has there been any discussion of raising the age to buy like Florida did to 21, Adam? Not in our caucus at this point. Amanda, your feeling about should this discussion include gun law changes? Absolutely. I mean, it has to. Again, we've seen it work in other countries. We know it works. It's just simply a political problem that we have that we can't do something. Okay, last subject of popcorn. How would you pay for our highways, given all the discussion? If it were up to you, wave a wand, Amanda, and pay for the highways of the future. Please. Yeah. Well, so actually, Governor Walker's previous secretary actually had put out a pretty good plan that had a variety of ways to look at paying for transportation. So definitely, I mean, gas tax, indexing, all that has to be part of it. Um, and also, you know, mixing, adding some things on, uh, you know, increasing registration fees, all of that. Um, it's not really just one one thing you I can don't do. hear the T word, tolls, man. Oh, I, tolls, I, I, I have said, I have said that is part of the solution. In and of itself, it will not solve the problem, and there's a lot of upfront costs. So again, it's not, like I was saying, there's no one thing we can point to that will solve it. It's really a mixture of things. Adam. Sure. Yeah, I, I would say that you know we're often boxed into these answers that are okay, raise taxes or you know do tolls. Uh, I will say that if you had to decide between one of those two, I think it would be a lot easier to go with something like Dale Cunyanga's plan that added a sales tax on gasoline uh, and not recreate the wheel. I have a bit of apprehension to do tolling because that's going to be a big capital investment. You know, there's going to be you know a, a lot of infrastructure that goes into that, uh, opposed to simply doing what our assembly plan was that was not signed off on. But I think we need to also start to think outside the box. One uh, area that, that I have uh, considered is the Blue Sign program. The Blue Sign program is uh, currently we contract it out, and there is a private company that generates the revenues for managing this the sign program and the companies that want to advertise, you know, all the McDonald's on the side of the road, they're paying a private company based out of Florida and that company is the one that manages. So we have all the tools to manage that program ourselves within the DOT and then we can generate those revenues. You know, is, is it going to solve the whole problem? No, but it's a step. It's a, we could generate, you know, millions of dollars a year just by operating. And I think there was a big push uh, before we got here to, to privatize things that, that were going to cost money. But what we didn't consider is when we privatize those things that generate revenue, well, that's money that we're losing. That's the revenue that we're losing because we don't want to do the operations. So I think there needs to be, we need to take a, a big look at all of the operations, the things that we have potentially uh, privatized so we didn't want to pay the cost of, but look at, okay, if they generate revenue on top of that operation, maybe this is a source of revenue that we can bring back into the fold. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things from advertising, naming rights, throw everything on the table and, and see see what works. Yeah, I've got two more questions sure. unless we have any Facebook questions. Okay, and first one is, you've got two children, you're about to have your second, Adam. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when, when one of your children grows up and says they want to run for elective office, what advice are you going to give them? Adam, it's your turn to go first. What advice would I give them? I, I would say that always be true to yourself. You know, whatever you feel like is the right thing to do, trust your instincts. You know, so many times we overanalyze and we think about this and we think about that. Well, in your gut, in your heart, you know the right thing to do, follow that. And, and I will say that I, I hope you're a Republican, but I'll support you either way. <laughs> Amanda. Well, I have a teenager already, and so he assures me daily he's never getting involved in politics. <laughs> and wants nothing to do with what I do. Uh, but if you ever did run, I would say, uh, honestly, just be yourself. Just trust your own instincts and your own gut about what you think is right, and uh, be a good person, and that pays off more than anything. And you would both encourage them to run if they, if they really wanted to? Absolutely. Absolutely. Last question. On the drive to the Capitol, 
What did you listen to? Talk radio, music, singer. Who'd you listen to? Amanda. I'll put a plug in my very favorite podcast, My Favorite Murder. It's all I ever listen to when I'm driving. <laughs> so shows were millennials. I listen to a podcast as well. Which one? Uh, it, it's called The New Washington. I, I love, it's by the New York Times. I really enjoy The Daily. Uh, it's put on by the same people that do The Daily. And it's a more in-depth look at different individuals that are impacting The New Washington. Uh, the one I listened to today was about Steve Bannon, but they also have one uh, on Paul Ryan that I have saved that I'm going to listen to. Uh, but it's a really uh, interesting podcast. It really delves into the biographies and what makes people tick that are kind of uh, big figureheads in current Washington. Fascinating answers. Well, I want to thank the co-chairs of the Wisconsin Future Caucus, Republican Representative Adam Nealon and Democratic Representative Amanda Stuck for joining us on TAP. Thanks to Industrious for hosting us. All right. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah.